Conventional wisdom has it that over the last 50 years, sleep duration has declined in parallel with the increasing prevalence of obesity, suggesting that an epidemic of sleep loss is associated with the epidemic of weight gain. Now we have triple-digit streaming TV channels, smartphones, and tablets to keep us entertained well into the night. The hurry and excitement of modern life is quite correctly held to be responsible for much of the insomnia, concluded one medical journal editorial, but that was an editorial published in 1894. Are we really sleeping that much less? Since 1905, sleep duration in children and adolescents has declined by a little over an hour a night, However, child labor wasn't outlawed until 1938, though, and so part of the explanation may be due to the exhaustion of sweating it out in the mines, farms, and factories in the early part of the last century. Since 1970, youth sleep duration has only declined about 15 minutes per night, and it's not clear sleep duration in adults has changed much at all. Based on 168 studies of objective measurements of sleep duration instead of just self-report, sleep duration in adults Objective total sleep time hasn't changed much since 1960. Since 2003, average sleep duration in the United States may have even gone up. Now, of course, just because we don't have evidence that there's been a growing epidemic of sleep deprivation, that doesn't necessarily mean we're getting enough sleep. Maybe we weren't getting enough sleep 50 years ago either, or since Edison's light bulbs, or since candles were invented 5,000 years ago. How might we determine the optimal sleep duration? One way would be to study millions of people and see how many hours a night is associated with the longest lifespan. Sleep is a great mystery, a trait shared across animal species. Sleep must be of vital importance to survive natural selection pressures to eliminate such a vulnerable state. Indeed, cringe-worthy experiments have shown that keeping animals awake long enough is fatal within 11 to 32 days. One of the functions of sleep that has been elucidated in recent years is the clearance of toxic waste substances that build up during the day through a newly discovered drainage system in the brain. This could help explain why those who routinely get less than seven hours of sleep at night may be at an increased risk of developing cognitive disorders such as dementia. Even a single all-nighter can cause a significant increase in beta amyloid accumulation in critical brain areas, a gummy substance implicated in the development of Alzheimer's disease. The lowest risk for developing cognitive impairment was found for those getting 7 to 8 hours of sleep a night, which is the same optimal range found for diabetes risk based on 36 studies following more than a million people. The increased risk associated with getting only 6 hours a night compared to 7 or 8 is comparable to the increase in diabetes risk linked to physical inactivity. For death from all causes combined, there's been more than 50 studies following hundreds of thousands of people for up to 34 years. Sleeping too short and too long are both associated with cutting one's life short with the apparent sweet spot at 7 hours a night. 7 hours may seem short, but that may actually be what's natural for our species. Scientists studied three isolated pre-industrial societies across two continents and found a surprising uniformity. Despite no electric lighting or gadgets, they stayed up until about three hours after sunset, and then typically rose before dawn, accumulating about a solid 6.5 hours of sleep out of about 7.5 hours in quote-unquote bed. A mechanism by which excess sleep might be harmful remains elusive, and so the association between increased risk of death and disease and sleeping nine or more hours a night has been largely dismissed as implausible. Uh, maybe it's reverse causation, sickness leading to more time in bed instead of vice versa, or confounding factors such as employment status. After all, who gets to sleep in? Those without a job to get to. However, there is experimental evidence showing negative health effects from insufficient sleep. So in terms of sleeping in the sweet spot, aim for at least seven hours of regular sleep a day. Sleep is crucial to the development of physically and psychologically healthy children, but a number of factors have been identified as interfering with sufficient sleep, including the use of electronic media devices. 
These days, most children, and nearly all adolescents, have at least one such device in their sleep environment, with most used near bedtime, and such use is associated with inadequate sleep quantity and quality, with resultant excessive daytime sleepiness. So there are calls to minimize device access at bedtime. But wait a second, not so fast. I mean, which came first, the media use, or the sleeping problem. Are they not sleeping because they're on their phone, or are they on their phone because they can't sleep? Higher media use has been consistently associated with all sorts of sleeping problems. Uh, is it because they're so caught up they push back their bedtimes, or does it so kind of key them up that they have trouble falling asleep? Uh, in college-age students, it may be more of the reverse, the not sleeping leading to pulling out their screens instead of just staring at the ceiling. Though in early childhood, it may be a bit of both. How might screen time interfere with sleep? It may not just be pushing back bedtimes and overstimulation. The light emitted from devices may affect circadian timing by interfering with the production of melatonin, the, the sleepiness hormone that starts ramping up as soon as the sun goes down. But put a screen in someone's face, and the excess light at night may confuse your brain. Uh, look, of course, if you're sitting there checking email with the lights on, then you're already overexposed, and a little extra from the screen may not make much of a difference. But if you're sitting in the dark uh, and you know, need to send off that final text or something, then having the light settings tweaked to yellow your screen may help. But what about the cell phone radiation? Might leaving your phone on the nightstand somehow affect your sleep? Uh, there's an enzyme called uh, beta trace protein that makes a sleep-promoting neurohormone in the brain. And researchers found that those with greater long-term cell or cordless phone exposure tend to have lower levels of this enzyme in their bloodstream. So the thinking is that the emissions may affect the release from the tissue surrounding the brain, especially those right up under the skull, closest to the phone. So there is a kind of possible mechanism if cell phones do indeed affect sleep, but you simply don't know uh, until you put it to the test. Study participants were exposed to 30 minutes of a cell phone in talk, listen, standby, or off modes. All the lights and speakers were disabled. Uh, there was insulation used to prevent them from feeling if it was heating up or anything, so the participants didn't know which group they were in. After the exposure, they took the phones away, shut off the lights, and told them to try to fall asleep. Those exposed to the phone when it was off, or in listen or standby mode, fell asleep within mm, 20 to 30 minutes. But after being exposed to the same phone in talk mode, it took an average of closer to 50 minutes to fall asleep. And the reason for the significant difference between talking and listening might be due to the fact that the typical SAR value, the, the specific absorption rate, how much cell phone energy your body absorbs, is about nine times higher when you're talking than when you're just listening to someone else talk. When you do finally get to sleep, though, what are the effects of cell phone exposure on sleep quality? There's been about 20 studies, split about half and half in terms of whether cell phone exposure affected sleep parameters, and not all in a negative way. Uh, it reminds me of the brain function data. Uh, yeah, an increase in the excitability in the brain cortex, the outer layer of the brain, in response to exposure to cell phone emissions might disrupt sleep, but that increased excitability may mean like faster reaction times. Uh, similarly, in affected study subjects, those exposed to an active cell phone showed significantly more R sleep. But R stands for REM, so they got like 4% more potential dream time, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're crossing three more time zones, and you plan on staying at your destination long enough to make it worthwhile, you can adjust your body clock to the new time with behavioral methods or pharmacological methods. The behavioral method is light exposure and light avoidance at specific times of the day, based on which direction you're going and how many time zones you cross. Uh, you may want to take a snapshot of this table for future reference. The pharmacological intervention is melatonin, the so-called darkness hormone. It's secreted by a little gland in the center of your head as soon as it gets dark, and shuts off when the sun comes up in the morning, thereby helping to set 
your circadian rhythm. Now, there's been a lot of research done on treating jet lag, but most of it has come from like lab rats instead of people. But most of the handful of human trials that have been done have found taking melatonin close to the target bedtime at the destination to try to sync your body to the new time can effectively decrease jet lag symptoms after long flights. Now, unlike most, or really all other drugs, the timing of the dose is critical and determines the effect. Given at the wrong time, it can make your jet lag even worse. Uh, for example, if you were to take melatonin at bedtime when traveling west. Dose-wise, taking between 0.5 and 5 mg seems to be similarly effective in terms of helping with jet lag symptoms, but the higher dose does seem to have more of kind of a sleeping pill type effect, which appears to plateau at about 5 mg. But I mean, those are massive doses. E even just taking a 3 mg dose produces levels in the bloodstream 50 times higher than normal nightly levels. Yeah, it works, but we don't know how safe that is. <laughs> After all, melatonin in the early days used to be known as the anti-gonad hormone, with human equivalent doses of just a milligram or two reducing the size of sex organs and impairing fertility in laboratory animals. Now, obviously rats aren't people, but I mean, considering the pronounced effects of melatonin on reproductive physiology in other mammals, to assume that it would not have some sexual effects in humans would almost seem naive. In fact, they speculate maybe melatonin could one day play a role as some sort of contraceptive agent. Wouldn't we know about these effects, though? Well, how? I mean, melatonin is available over-the-counter as a dietary supplement, so there's no you know, post-marketing surveillance like there is with prescription drugs. And then there's the purity problem. I mean, supplements are so poorly regulated that you never really know what's actually in them. Uh, for these reasons, melatonin supplements cannot be recommended. Is the purity issue just theoretical, though? You don't know until you put it to the test. And indeed, due to the poor quality control of over-the-counter melatonin, what they say is often not what you get. Melatonin is not only one of the most popular supplements among adults, but children too, which makes it even more egregious that actual melatonin content varied up to nearly 500% compared to what it actually said on the label, based on an analysis of 31 different brands, and most had just a fraction of what they said. And the most variable sample was a chewable tablet, which is what kids might take. It said it had 1.5 mg, but actually had 9, uh, which could result in like 100 times higher than natural levels. In short, there was no guarantee of the strength or purity of over-the-counter melatonin, leading these researchers to suggest it should be regulated as a drug so that by law at least it would have what it says on the bottle. OK, but that's strength. What about purity? Four of six melatonin products from health food stores, two-thirds, contained unidentified impurities. With no exclusive patent, no pharmaceutical company wants to pay for the necessary toxicological studies. I mean, the stuff is just sold so dirt cheap. Uh, they recommend buying it from some large, reputable pharmacy chain and just hoping for the best, but this study suggests it's not worth the risk. Contaminants present in tryptophan supplements were reported to be responsible for a 1980s outbreak of a disease that affected more than 1,000 people and resulted in dozens of deaths. Given the structural similarities of tryptophan and melatonin, maybe when you're trying to synthesize melatonin, those same toxic contaminants could be created. And indeed, here's the contaminant blamed on the tryptophan epidemic, and here's what they found in melatonin supplements. That's a little too close for comfort, suggesting melatonin supplements may just be another accident, another epidemic waiting to happen. If your cortisol is high in the afternoon or high in the evening, you might feel tired and wired. You want to sleep, but you can't or you might fall asleep because you're really tired, and then you wake up in the middle of the night. Today we're gonna to talk about sleep, and not just sleep problems in general, but why we may wake up between one and four in the morning, 
and how you can fix that. Because a lot of times people have restless sleep, they wake up in the middle of the night, they can't go back to sleep, and it really affects the quality of their health, their life, and everything else. So sleep is critical to our health, to longevity, to our mental health, to basically every physiological function we have. And it really is important to fix it. So let's talk about what you can do to stay asleep and to sleep more deeply. So we know that poor sleep makes us less productive and makes us tired, hard to focus. Basically, having sleep deprivation is basically equivalent to being drunk um, in terms of your performance. Uh, you know, I read a study once where they were uh, snipers who were, you know, excellent shots. And if they had eight hours sleep, they were like 100% accurate. If they had seven hours sleep, they were like 95% accurate. If they had six hours sleep, they were like 70% accurate. And if they were like less than six hours sleep, they were basically like, 50%. It's like almost a uh, hit and miss. So not good. Even when you're an expert in something, you can't function when you're tired. So next to sort of nutrition exercise, and maybe even before it, some would argue sleep may be the fundamental foundation of health and disease prevention and even weight control. So why, why is it so important? How do, how do the sleep dysfunction lead to changes? Well, there's a very important hormone called cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And, and it helps um, when it's in balance to go up in the morning to get you energetic and focused and do the things you need to do for the day. And at night, it's supposed to go down and you're supposed to calm down and relax. And a lot of people have an inversion where their cortisol is low in the morning, they can't get out of bed, and at night, they're tired and wired. Sound familiar? I bet you some big experience that I certainly have at different moments in my life. When you lay, get down in bed, you're exhausted, but you can't fall asleep because you're just wired. It has to do with your adrenal glands. And they, they're designed to keep things in balance, to regulate your weight, to moderate your stress response, to control blood sugar, regulate inflammation, and uh, regulate sleep and wake cycles. So when we're constantly in a state of stress, we're, we're actually often struggling with sleep because of, of the way in which it affects our sleep. So when you're, when you're thinking about it, when your cortisol is high, you're running from a tiger, you're in danger, you don't want to be sleeping, <laughs> you want to be alert. And that's the problem. So if your cortisol levels are balanced and they're high in the morning and then low at night and your blood sugar stays even, we'll talk about why that's important. Because fluctuations in blood sugar often will cause midnight or mid middle of the night awakening. But when your cortisol and your body stress response and balance, then your pineal gland produces something called melatonin that pulses really strong in the afternoon and the evening, which gets you ready for sleep and let your cortisols drop off, and then you can feel calm and go to sleep at night and feel sleepy. Uh, and if you're healthy and balanced in your circadian rhythms, in your cortisol and melatonin cycles, you'll be fine. But if your cortisol is high in the afternoon or high in the evening, you might feel tired and wired. You want to sleep, but you can't. Or you might fall asleep because you're really tired, and then you wake up in the middle of the night, like between one and four. And, and that happens when you sort of go, 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 do your email, you're working, working, working and busy. And then you go to bed and you're like, and then you fall asleep because you're exhausted, but you end up waking up because your body is still in a stress state. There's still high levels of cortisol. So how does, how does stress affect your sleep wake cycles? Well, it works in a lot of different ways. Psychological stress uh, can be a big factor, right? Worries about family, work, money. Uh, physical stresses, lack of exercise is a stress, believe it or not, too much screen time, junk food, uh, toxic lifestyles, uh, uh, hormonal imbalances, you know, environmental toxins, all these drive increased inflammation, increased brain inflammation, and, and also increased cortisol. Because by the way, do you know this, that when you eat sugar or starch, your body responds by jerking up the adrenaline and cortisol levels. So literally eating sugar is a stressful experience to your body. Even if you're getting pleasure and you don't think it's stressful and you're meditating while you're eating sugar, you're still going to have high cortisol and high adrenaline. Um, so what are the what are the things that are the two most common things that are, are screwing up your sleep-wake cycles? It's probably blood sugar imbalances and spikes and crashes in blood sugar um, and chronic stress. So what should you do to optimize nutrition so you can regulate your stress hormones through food and lifestyle? And how do you deal with actually regulating sleep throughout the whole night and get high quality sleep? So first thing is our bodies, whether we like it or not, are biological organisms and they run in circadian rhythms and they need to be 
balance. So you have to live in rhythm. And I, I experienced the, the dangers of not being in rhythm when I worked in the emergency room. I would sometimes work a seven in the morning till five at night shift. Then I'd work at two in the afternoon till the two in the morning shift. Then I'd work an 11 o'clock at night to a seven in the morning shift. Then I'd work an eight in the morning to an eight in the morning shift, 24 hour shift. I was all over the place and my whole system became dysregulated. And ultimately it led to chronic fatigue syndrome and a bunch of other stuff. My system just kind of collapsed because I was pushing through all these circadian rhythms, which have to be in balance for you to be healthy. Uh, and whether we like it or not, you know, we tend to do a lot better from our health perspective if we go to bed at the same time, if we wake at the same time, if we eat at the same time. Our bodies are designed like that. So you you want to make sure that you actually uh, don't eat before bed because that's the worst thing you can do. But you need to make sure you're having meals in a regular time space. So don't eat three hours before bed. Don't eat a heavy meal before bed because that guarantee you that'll screw up your sleep. Also, carbohydrates, uh, I think if you want to actually eat some starchy things like sweet potatoes or some more starchy foods and you can handle it metabolically, make sure you do it at night because the uh, serotonin levels go up and it helps with sleep when you have your carbohydrates. But still, don't eat white flour, sugar, process, all that processed food. Also, um, not eating enough is stressful. If your body's not getting enough food, it's also considered a stress. Now, you can do time-restricted eating and you can sort of narrow the window in which you eat for longevity purposes and so on. But you also want to make sure you're getting enough food and not actually starving because that will increase cortisol and you'll wake in the middle of the night. Now, if you want to lose weight, uh, you can use uh, what I think is probably the most effective treatment I've ever found, which is the 10-day detox diet. It helped people lose 120, 130, 200 pounds it's like a gastric bypass without the pain of surgery, vomiting, and malnutrition. Um, the other thing you can do is, is, is get stuff out of your head. You know, write your voice down at night. So get a little you know, piece of paper or journal or maybe in your phone. Write down all your worries, what you have to do. Your day should be organized for the next day. Free up your mind so you can actually let go of things and go into a deep, restful sleep. Next, you can try a number of supplements and things that I found very helpful. Magnesium is super important. It's the relaxation mineral. It helps regulate the stress response, helps you regulate cortisol, helps relax your muscles. I recommend two to 400 even more of magnesium glycinate before bed. Glycine also helps with sleep, so you can use glycine. Uh, and you can use that to help relax the nervous system and your, and your muscles. Uh, next, Try some melatonin. Mellow out with a little melatonin. You can use half to up to two to three milligrams of melatonin at night, and that can often help you reset your circadian rhythms, particularly with uh, travel. Also, um, ashwagandha is an Ayurvedic herb that can be really powerful for resetting cortisol. I use a product called Cortisol Manager, which helps at night to reduce the stress response and improve sleep quality. Also, make sure, as I said, to get in rhythm, you know, we well, can sleep at the same time. Try to go to sleep before 10. That's the best sleep you can have is before midnight, believe it or not. So get in bed by 10, try to be asleep shortly thereafter, 11 at the latest. And try to wake up at the same time every day. Also make your bedroom completely sleep uh, supportive. For example, make sure you have eye shades or blackout shades on your windows or eye shades on your eyes, earplugs if it's noisy. Make sure you you really take care of creating a, a carefully controlled environment. Next is caffeine. You know, some is tolerated okay and metabolize it, others don't. So I encourage you to sort of maybe stop after breakfast uh, coffee. Don't have coffee throughout the day. That's particularly important. If you're still struggling, I would probably just stop coffee and caffeine altogether. Uh, alcohol definitely screws up sleep. So if you want to sleep well and you're not sleeping well, quit alcohol. Just get off it. It can interrupt sleep. It creates poor sleep quality. Also, sunlight is basically great medicine. You know, what I mean, sunlight, I'm going to go to sleep. No, but 20 minutes of sunlight in the morning without sunglasses on, outdoors, not behind a window, has a big effect on your circadian rhythm. So we are photobiomodulating organisms. The, the light affects us. It regulates our biology. And it's important to make sure you have a good 20 minutes of light exposure in the morning. So those are some simple tips that you can do to help... Uh, sleep issues often by the way at night if you're having a crash and hot flashes at night and night sweats that can often be low sugar and so that's really important to balance your insulin and blood sugar and i've written a lot about that like the 10 day detox diet is a great way to do that now if you're still having trouble sleeping there are many other reasons it could be 
uh, you know, inflammation from food sensitivities. It could be thyroid issues, could be menopausal stuff, could be toxins, heavy metals, uh, depression, many things, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Make sure you work with a functional medicine doctor, but check it out. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee of the strength or purity of over-the-counter melatonin supplements, which have been found to contain impurities that raise serious safety questions. For these reasons, melatonin supplements cannot be recommended. Too bad there's no way you could get the benefits without the risks, unless melatonin was somehow found naturally in certain foods you could eat. Melatonin was first discovered in plants in 1995, and has since been found throughout the plant kingdom. But enough that eating them actually affects your levels? Yes, you randomize people to eat more or less vegetables, and you can see the effect. Hard to get people to eat vegetables, though. How about beer? The melatonin present in beer contributes to increases in the level of melatonin in the human bloodstream, though alcohol consumption may actually mess with your own endogenous melatonin secretion, so beer probably isn't the best choice. Eat two bananas or drink the juice of about two pounds of oranges or pineapple, and you can get significant bumps in melatonin concentrations in your blood. And the melatonin levels found in those fruits are actually pretty modest compared to some other foods. Here's the breakdown. The single food within each category with the highest recorded melatonin level and how much you'd have to eat at one time to reach a physiological dose in your bloodstream. Uh, we make melatonin, so it should come to no surprise that other animals do too. The most melatonin-rich meat tested was salmon, uh, but because there's only billionths of a gram per serving, you'd have to sit down and eat about 200 pounds to get the effect. OK, so forget meat. What about whole grains? The highest recorded was a strain of corn so rich in melatonin you'd only have to eat 16 ears of corn. All right, scratch that. What about other vegetables? Plain white button mushrooms top the list only 2 pounds, 100 times more melatonin than meat, but still, they're so light. I mean, 2 pounds is like eating 10 cups of mushrooms. That's a lot in one sitting. Thankfully, cranberries to the rescue, the most melatonin-rich fruit, just a single ounce. And it's like you just took a melatonin supplement, with only good side effects other than, of course, the extreme sourness. That's about a third of a cup of cranberries. Uh, they're pretty sturdy, so you could travel with them without them getting smushed. Uh, but what do you do with them once you get there? Uh, easy to blend into a smoothie, but what if you're stuck in a hotel? Can you eat dried cranberries, like uh, uh, what do they call craisins? A study of various tart cherry products suggests that the drying process wipes out the melatonin, so no melatonin in dried cherries, and presumably dried cranberries either, nor in juice. Uh, the level of melatonin in cherry juice concentrate was almost non-detectable, so drinking cranberry juice would also presumably be a wash. Which brings us to nuts. Pistachios are not just the most melatonin-rich nut, they are simply off the charts as the most melatonin-rich food ever recorded. Uh, to get a physiological dose of melatonin, all you have to do is eat two. What? Two what? No, just two pistachios. Uh, check it out. Here, here's the data. More than 200 micrograms of melatonin per gram, 0.2 milligrams per gram. And you can get the normal daily spike your brain gives you, taking just 0.3 micrograms, so, so just two nuts. So, so taking a whole handful of pistachio nuts is like taking one of those high-dose melatonin supplements. Uh, so the best food for jet lag appears to be appropriately timed pistachio. The number one question in sleep research is, why do we sleep? Followed by the question, how much sleep do we need? After literally hundreds of studies, we still don't know the best answer to either question. A few years ago, I featured a large 100,000-person study suggesting that both short and long sleep duration were associated with increased mortality. 
with people getting around seven hours of sleep living longest. Since then, a meta-analysis of all such studies, including more than a million people, was published, and they found the same thing. We still don't know, though, if sleep duration is a cause or simply a marker of ill health. Maybe sleeping too little or too long does make you unhealthy, or maybe we see the associated lifespan shortening because being unhealthy causes you to sleep shorter or longer. Similar work has now been published on cognitive function. After controlling for a long list of factors, men and women in their 50s and 60s getting seven or eight hours appear to have the best short-term memory compared to those that got much more or much less. Same thing was just demonstrated with immune function. Both reduced and prolonged habitual sleep durations were associated with an increased risk of pneumonia. It's easy to prevent oversleeping, set an alarm, but what if your problem is not getting enough? What if you're the one in three adults that suffers symptoms of insomnia? Sure, there are drugs like Valium you can take for insomnia in the short term, but they have a number of adverse side effects, and non-pharmacological approaches such as cognitive behavioral therapy are often difficult, time-consuming, and don't always work. Wouldn't it be great to have natural treatments that can improve both sleep onset and help patients improve the quality of sleep while improving next-day symptoms over the long term? The effect of kiwi fruit consumption on sleep quality in adults with sleep problems. Two kiwi fruit an hour before bed every night for four weeks. Why study kiwi fruits? Well, people with sleep disorders tend to have high levels of oxidative stress, so maybe you know, antioxidant-rich foods may help. But you know, all fruits and vegetables have antioxidants. Ah, but kiwi fruits contain twice the serotonin of tomatoes, but it really shouldn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Kiwi fruit has folate, and a deficiency might cause insomnia, but there's lots more folate in some other plant foods. The reason they studied kiwi fruits is because they got grant money from a kiwi fruit company. And I'm glad they did, because they found some really remarkable results. Significantly improved sleep onset, duration, and efficiency using both subjective and objective measurements, uh, went from sleeping six hours a night to seven, just eating a few kiwi fruit. We know that not sleeping enough is associated with changes in diet. Uh, people tend to eat worse. But what about the opposite question? Can food affect sleep? We saw from the kiwi fruit study that this seemed possible, but the mechanism they suggested for the effect of serotonin levels in kiwi fruit doesn't make any sense, since serotonin can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So you can eat all the serotonin you want, and it shouldn't affect your brain chemistry. A different brain chemical, though, melatonin, can get from our gut to our brain. Melatonin is a hormone secreted at night to help regulate our circadian rhythms by the pineal gland in the center of our brain. Supplements of the stuff are used to prevent and reduce jet lag. And about 20 years ago, MIT got the patent to use melatonin to help people sleep. Melatonin is not only produced in the pineal gland, though, but also is naturally present in edible plants. That might explain the results of this study, the effects of a tart cherry juice beverage on the sleep of older adults with insomnia. The research group had been doing an earlier study on tart cherry juice as a sports recovery drink. Uh, see, there's a phytonutrient in cherries with anti-inflammatory effects on par with drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen. So they were trying to see if they could help reduce muscle soreness after exercise, and some of the participants in the study just anecdotally said that they were sleeping better on the cherries. That was unexpected. But the researchers realized that you know, cherries are a plant food source of melatonin, so they put it to the test. The reason they chose older subjects is that melatonin production tends to drop as we age, which may be one reason why there's higher insomnia rates in the elderly. So they 
took a group of older men and women suffering from chronic insomnia and put half on cherries and half on placebo. Now, they couldn't use whole cherries for this study, because how could you fool people with a fake placebo cherry? So they used cherry juice versus cherry Kool-Aid, and found significant but modest improvements in sleep. So, for example, fell to sleep a few minutes faster and had 17 fewer minutes of waking after sleep onset, meaning you know, waking up in the middle of the night. So it was no insomnia cure, but it helped without side effects. How do we know it was the melatonin, though? Well, they repeated the study, this time measuring the melatonin levels, and indeed saw a boost in circulating melatonin levels after the cherry juice, but not after the Kool-Aid. Similar results were found in people eating the actual cherries, seven different varieties, boosting melatonin levels and actual sleep times. The effects of all the other phytonutrients in cherries can't be precluded. Maybe they help too. But if it is the melatonin, there are more potent sources than cherries. Orange bell peppers has a, have a bit, uh, an ounce of walnuts, a tablespoon of flax seeds has about as much as a tomato, all less than the tart cherries that were tested. But people may eat a lot more tomatoes than cherries, especially tart cherries. Sweet cherries have 50 times less melatonin than tart, and dried cherries appear to have none. In fact, the melatonin content of tomatoes was suggested as one of the reasons traditional Mediterranean diets were so healthy. A few spices are pretty potent. Just a teaspoon of fenugreek seeds or mustard seeds has about as much as a few tomatoes. But the bronze, silver, and gold go to almonds, raspberries, and goji berries off the charts. Now, even gojis just have you know, 15 micrograms an ounce, but melatonin is potent stuff. You inject just 10 into people, and you can boost their blood levels 50-fold in five minutes. If weakening our circadian rhythm can cause weight gain, might strengthening it facilitate weight loss? In our child swing analogy, regular morning meals can give our cycles a little daily push, but the biggest shove comes from our exposure to bright morning light. Similarly, exposure to light at night could be analogous to nighttime eating. Uh, yes, we've had you know, candles to illuminate our nights for 5,000 years, but flames from candles, campfires, and oil lamps are skewed towards the red end of the light spectrum, and it's the shorter blue wavelengths that specially set our circadian clocks. Even incandescent electric lighting, starting a little over a century ago, consisted of mainly low-level yellow wavelengths, replaced over just the last few decades with fluorescence and LED lights that now contain extra blue wavelengths, which is more similar to morning sunlight and has the strongest effect on our circadian rhythms. Using wrist meters to measure ambient light exposure, researchers found that increased evening and light time exposure correlated with a subsequent increased risk of developing obesity over time. This was presumed to be due to circadian misalignment, but maybe instead a sign that they're not sleeping as much? Maybe that's the real reason they grew heavier? Uh, this was controlled for in a study of more than 100,000 women, which found that the odds of obesity trended with higher nighttime light exposure, independent of sleep duration. Compared to women who reported their rooms at night were too dark to see their hand in front of their face, or at least too dark to see across the room, those who reported that it was light enough to see across their bedrooms at night were significantly heavier. It's not that they were all sleeping with their night lights on. Without blackout curtains on the windows, many neighborhoods may be bright enough to cause circadian disruption. Using satellite imagery, uh, scientists have even been able to correlate higher obesity rates with brighter communities. Um, there's so much light at night these days that outside of a blackout, the only Milky Way our children will likely ever see is in a candy wrapper. Although sleep quantity could be controlled for, what about sleep quality? Uh, maybe people sleeping in less dim bedrooms don't sleep as soundly, leaving them too tired to 
exercise the next day or something. You can't know for sure if nocturnal light exposure is harmful in and of itself until you put it to the test. When that was done, those randomized to exposure to bright light for a few hours in the evenings, or even a single night, suffered adverse metabolic consequences. The more intriguing question then becomes, can circadian syncing with morning bright light therapy be a viable weight loss strategy? Insufficient morning light may be the circadian equivalent of breakfast skipping. Indoor lighting is too bright at night, uh, but maybe too dim in the day to robustly boost our daily rhythm. Light exposure from getting outdoors in the morning, even on overcast days, is correlated to lower body weight compared to typical office lighting, so some doctors started trying phototherapy to treat obesity. Uh, the first case reports started to be published back in the 90s. Three out of four women lost an average of about four pounds over six weeks of morning bright light exposure, but there was no control group to confirm the effect. Ten years later, the first randomized controlled trial was published. Overweight individuals were randomized to an exercise intervention with or without an hour a day of bright morning light. Compared to normal indoor lighting, the bright light group lost more body fat. But it's possible the light just stimulated them to exercise harder. Studies show that bright light exposure, even the day prior to exercise, may boost performance. In a hand grip endurance test, exposure to hours of bright light increased the number of contractions uh, until exhaustion from about um, 770 to 860 the next day. While light-induced improvements in activity or mood can be helpful in their own right, it would be years later still before we finally learn whether the light exposure itself could boost weight loss. Following an unpublished study in Norway purporting to show a dozen-pound weight loss advantage to uh, eight weeks of 30 minutes of daily daylight compared to indoor lighting, researchers tried three weeks of 45-minute morning bright light compared to the same time sitting in front of a quote-unquote ion generator that appeared to turn on but was secretly deactivated. The three weeks of light beat out the placebo, but the average difference in body fat reduction was only about a pound. The slight edge didn't seem to correlate with mood changes, but you know, bright light alone can stimulate serotonin production in the human brain and, and cause a release of you know, adrenaline-type hormones, both of which uh, could benefit body fat aside from any circadian effects. Regardless of the mechanism, bright morning daylight exposure could present a novel weight loss strategy straight out of the clear blue sky.